Uh, good afternoon. My name is Patrick Tui, the co-founder and director of policy for the Better Cities Project. I'm honored to be a fellow of the Dole Institute this spring, and I'm grateful to all of you who have taken time out of your day to join us. For the past few years, I have worked in public policy issues affecting American cities. Those cities and their challenges will be the topic of our seven-week discussion series this semester. 65 million Americans live in our top 100 cities. Those cities are our economic and cultural engines, sources of innovation, collaboration, and advancement. Cities are, to quote one Harvard economist, humanity's greatest invention. And yet it is an irony of American democracy that we spend so much time and effort talking about national politics, where our individual power to bring change is weakest, and so little time considering local policy, where our power is greatest. As the past year has demonstrated, the men and women who serve on the front lines of local policy affect a great deal of our daily lives. The Better Cities Project and this seven-week series aims to shine light on our cities, address some of their challenges, and celebrate those policymakers we entrust to plow our streets, keep us safe, and maintain the many systems that allow us to thrive. Cities are not without their challenges. Over the past decade, cities have become the victim of their own success as wealthier Americans sought the comfort and space of suburban communities. Cities had to grapple with the consequential impact to their tax base and often develop policies that only exacerbated their problems. Some of the negative outcomes were merely unfortunate results of well-intended policies, but others we'll discuss in this series were intentionally sinister. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic turned one of our city's core characteristics, population density, from asset to albatross. Lockdowns have crippled local economies in ways that will be felt for years. In order to climb out of the economic calamity, city leadership will need to assess all of their public policies, from taxation to incentives, policing and poverty, transportation, housing, and zoning. Our ways of regulating business, our assumption about what motivates entrepreneurs, and how to meet the needs of our poor are all worthy of reconsideration. Importantly, I hope to show city leaders that they are not alone in facing these challenges. And while each city has its own unique identity and advantages in overcoming these obstacles, city leaders can learn from policies that have been adopted elsewhere. Each seminar will include panelists who have conducted original research on these topics. We'll discuss the history of the issue, where we stand now, and what the opportunities are for growth and improvement. Today, we're going to start the discussion at the beginning. We're going to define what we mean by cities and how their populations have grown and shifted over time. My guest is Wendell Cox. Wendell is a principal of the St. Louis-based Demographia, where he consults with public policy leaders around the world. He's been appointed to serve both Democrats and Republicans on issues related to transportation. He's co-author of the Demographia International Housing Affordability Survey and author of Demographic, Demographia World Urban Areas. He's a senior fellow at the Urban Reform Institute in Houston and the Frontier Center for Public Policy in Winnipeg, as well as a member of the Board of Advisors as the Center for Demographics and Policy at Chapman University. Wendell, thanks for joining me and uh, let's get started. And pleasure to be so, here. So first of all, uh, let's just discuss terms. What is a demographer? Uh, where do they get the information and, and what do they contribute to our understanding of public policy? Well, demographers, demographers principally deal with statistics and analysis of uh, human populations. Uh, and the sources uh, vary greatly, and I'm sorry to say that much of what you read on demographics is really not very good. Um, I'm interested in government data, uh, in data that is recognized uh, uh, as being expert data, and, and especially with the coming of the Internet, I, I've got to tell you that 80% of what I see come across my desk in terms of demographic analysis um, is of little use at all. Okay, so without mentioning names or publications, no. can you give an example of bad information? We think. In, well, for example, this. I remember. I remember. Sorry. I remember a few years ago when a when a columnist in Sydney uh, decided that, that she had to show how how uh, how 
how lo low the densities were in Sydney. And to do so, she compared the density of the entire metropolitan area, uh, about 90% of which was rural, to the density of Manhattan. Obviously, this lady, I gave away that much, uh, had no idea what she was talking about. We see that kind of stuff all the time. Or one of my favorite things is comparison of Chinese cities uh, to cities in Europe and America. Uh, in fact, Chinese cities are, 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 are uh, oftentimes con principally rural, where, for example, you're not going to find a lot of rural area in the city of New York or the city of Philadelphia. You know, you remind me of a, a press conference where I believe it was the police chief of St. Louis complained about how misleading it was that St. Louis is high on the um, homicide rate. And it's because St. Louis is so compact and so densely urban uh, that it's almost not fair to compare it with Kansas City, which has a lot more open space and, and undeveloped, even within the city boundaries. Well, yeah, in fact, that's one of my main points. I mean, if you look at, for example, in metropolitan areas, which which are the functional, and I think it would be good if we could to throw up the, the slide at this point. I'm sort of jumping ahead of you, uh, Patrick, but you know, the, the, the economic or functional definition of the city is the metropolitan area. We see here the Kansas City metropolitan area, the big blue line around it, a circle, um, goes around the counties that are a part of the, of the Kansas City metropolitan area. Uh, that those counties are all economically connected to the urban area, which is inside the red area. The point is that metropolitan areas are labor markets. They are where if, if you, you think about the old line about driving until you qualify. Well, I suspect you probably call you probably qualify for a house up in Caldwell County or down in Lynn County a lot sooner than you do uh, closer in. So the point is that the functional definition or economic definition of a city is the metropolitan area. The physical de definition is the urban area, and the urban area is the urbanization. In other words, there's a point when you come out of Johnson County, for example, headed over toward Lawrence County, that you're going to get into farms. That's where the urban area ends. And few terms are more misunderstood than the term city. So, so for the purpose of this, I use the term interchangeably to mean MSA and, and city and built up urban areas. Is there a, a standard you prefer that's most clear? Well, the, the point is there are three different things. First of all, uh, the, the city, such as the city of Lawrence or the city of, of uh, St. Louis or Kansas City, is not from an economic standpoint a city. It is a part of a metropolitan area, which is the economic um, entity. The average major metropolitan area in the United States, and those are the 53 with more than a million, a million people, has 127 cities in it. Okay, so, so yes, indeed, cities are important, but as economic entities, they are only parts. And so that's why I always like to use the term municipality to, 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 to refer to a city like Kansas City or Lawrence, and um, metropolitan area, obviously, to refer to a labor market and urban area to refer to the built up urban area. And the built up urban area is very important because we hear a lot of people talk about density. And we'll be talking about urban density a little bit today here. Um, the only place that urban density, city density should be measured is at the urban area level. Because believe it or not, about 80% of the land in US metropolitan areas is rural. And, the, and it's made up of counties and one of our counties um, is about 20,000 square miles. That's about two thirds the size of Austria. So, you know, when you have building blocks that vary in size from 19 square miles or 20 square miles in Manhattan to 20,000 square miles in San Bernardino County, it's nonsensical to refer to metropolitan area densities. The only place that densities count are at the urban area level and obviously neighborhoods within the urban areas. And you'll go from very low densities in some of the suburbs to very high densities in the core cities. It occurs to me that that's a real challenge uh, for city leaders, for municipal leaders that are all kind of thrown into this uh, job market, right? This economic area, they rely on one another. Um, but you know, Kansas City's history is that uh, the leadership of the various municipalities within a metropolitan area don't necessarily get along or don't 
uh, may not may not think that they're all in it together when in fact they are. Well, yeah, there, there, there obviously are two important elements. One is the cooperation between the municipalities, et cetera. And, and each of our American um, metropolitan areas has uh, regional coordinating uh, bodies that, that uh, make some decisions and recommendations and so on. So it's not all, it's not cacophony by any means. Uh, but there is a need for cooperation. At the same time, there is a real big need for competition. Because when, when we have multiple cities in a metropolitan area, and of course we do around the country for the most part, uh, the cities compete with one another and they compete on tax rates, et cetera. And if you have just one city, you can expect in the long run that it's gonna be a lot more expensive than having many cities. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit today and certainly in the future about economic development subsidies where cities kind of use goodies to compete with one another to lure companies across boundaries. Of course, you and I know that doesn't result in any job or economic growth within the metropolitan area, but it might for the small constituent municipalities that that, that make it up. Well, yes, and, and it's not just the small ones. I mean, we see this all the time, the huge uh, uh, subsidies that go to try to attract um, businesses and so on. And, and the, the key is, I, I mean, it, there's no doubt that it is difficult for the core cities to compete with suburban cities. Um, and, and, and that's true around the country. And, and in an older city like Kansas City, uh, that's definitely the case. Um, but regrettably, um, uh, the, the the competition always doesn't work, doesn't always work that well, and th there has been this movement away from the core cities for a lot of reasons. Some justified, some perhaps not justified, but the fact is people have moved for lower taxes, they've moved for better services. That's not to say suburban services are always better, but the fact is, especially in the post-COVID era, where we see a rush of people around the world from core cities to exurban and suburban areas out of fear of future infections and the impact of, of social distancing and all that kind of thing, it is gonna be a much tougher environment and the cities, the core cities, the older cities are going to have to learn to compete a lot better than they have in the past to survive. So uh, just to, to finish up on, on standards and terms, is there a clear definition of, uh, of exurb and suburb, or is it just a particular distance from the downtown, or is it a matter of density? Well, well, it, there's a lot of disagreement about that. A, a lot of people like, and the, the demographic data has not been very good. That is to say, we haven't had good quality data at the low levels, at low census tract levels uh, until fairly recently. It used to be 10 years ago when we talked about uh, suburbs versus cities, we would talk about the city of Kansas City versus the rest of the metropolitan area being suburbs. However, um, you know, that made no sense because, for example, the city of Atlanta is less than 10 percent of the six million people in the in the Atlanta metropolitan area. City of Hartford is less than 10 percent. And the city of San Antonio is two thirds the population of the metropolitan area, which basically goes at one of your earlier points that you can't compare St. Louis and Kansas City because the slice of the urbanization is so much smaller um, in in. Um, in, in, in St. Louis. But we have put together and are using in our environment a, a, an analysis that basically tries to siphon off or to, 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 to put to one side what I call the urban core. And the urban core is what development existed at the end of World War II. We had a sea change at the end of World War II in this country. The automobile uh, really took over like it, it had taken over before, but it took over really to a greater degree after that. Um, people started moving to the suburb. Almost all the growth in U.S. metropolitan areas was in suburbs after that point, even in a place like Phoenix. You know, we've got places like Phoenix and San Jose and Austin where they are central cities, but they are largely suburban. Um, you, you, you know, Phoenix it looks like the St. Louis suburbs, except it's a lot, uh, a, a lot hotter. So the point is what we've done is put together a classification systems that has sort of the central business district or downtown area, then sort of the inner urban ring. And if you get those two together, you get the 1945 city and then the suburbs that were created before 1980 
the suburbs that have been created after 1980, and the exurbs would be that part of the metropolitan area that is outside the urban area. So uh, first of all, let me re right. remind our remind our viewers and encourage uh, anyone who has questions, you can email a question uh, to me and Wendell at dolequestions at ku.edu, and uh, we will endeavor to get to as many of those as we can uh, towards the end of our talk. Uh, you you talked a little I, bit about could, world... Patrick, sure. If, if I could, Patrick, let me just say that <clears throat> we find that 15% of the population of major metropolitan areas is urban core, CBD and inner ring. A lot of people find that figure surprising, but we are an 85% suburban nation. Canada is 75% and Australia is 80%. So that's what's happened to our urban areas. Uh, they have really become suburban. And CBD, you mean central business district? Central business district. That's right. Yep. And again, there's no, I, I'm looking for a concrete definition of, you know, uh, when the buildings are four stories and higher. But but there's no such uh, definition. No, it's just uh, the 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 break point that I use is seven thousand five hundred per square mile, uh, and and at that point you basically catch what I'm seeking to catch, and that's it. And, the the and density now densities go a lot more than that. The the highest densities in the country are about two hundred thousand per square mile. Not many of those, but they do exist. And uh, to your earlier point, there isn't a lot of agreement on those standards on where the breakoff point should be in, in the field of, of demographics. Is that right? That's pretty much true. And I think a lot of that is because um, a, a, a lot of it <clears throat> is ancient history to a lot of people. I mean, you cannot believe the transformation of the American city and, by the way, the international city, because the same thing happened in Europe 10 to 15 years later, not quite to the same extent, but almost. Uh, but the city today, whether we are talking about Europe or America or Australia or Canada, looks radically different than it looked in 1945. So uh, you mentioned ancient history. Let, let's talk a little bit about that, and, and you'll correct my assumptions. I've read that in 1800, about 7% of the global population uh, lived in urban areas. Uh, that doubled to 16% in 1900. Uh, and uh, I think it's around 75% today in the United States. Uh, is, it, is it 1945? Is it post-World War II where that really took off? Yeah, exactly. That, that combined with the rise of the what we would call the third world, the underdeveloped world, uh, which really began growing like you cannot believe, uh, perhaps in the 80s or 90s. But, but what you have um, is, is a situation where the um i'm just a minute i lost it what you have is uh right now we have about 55 percent of the population the press always likes to say according to un data lives in 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 uh, cities or urban areas and our new york media you know goes out on fifth avenue and they imagine that 55 percent of the people live in an environment like that in fact the median urban resident lives in an urban area the size of Baton Rouge or Albany, New York. Now, these are good-sized cities, but the fact is the average urban resident in the world does not live in anything we would consider to be a major city. Uh, and this is an aside. I understand that in the United States, uh, as I said in the introduction, the wealthy have moved out to the suburbs, but that's not necessarily true in Europe where a lot of times the wealthy live in the downtown core and the suburbs are where the uh, maybe the more rundown neighborhoods. Is that is that true? That, that, is more tr that, that is more true in Europe, but not as true as some would have you believe. In fact, if you look and, and this is this, if you look at the core cities in the United States with more than 400,000 people uh, and their population in 2000 compared to 19, 1950, um, none increased in population except for New York City. Every other one lost population, including the city of St. Louis, which lost 61% of its population. If you go to Europe, you find virtually the same thing. Not quite as bad, but Copenhagen, one of, one of, one of uh, a lot of people's favorite European cities, lost about 40% of its population. They all lost. Now, that's turned around to some degree because of the big migration during the EU enlargement from Eastern Europe. Uh, but the fact is, suburbanization has uh, has has taken over the world, 
there is no question that the demographics of suburbanization tend to be somewhat different in Europe than they are in the United States. Uh, but still, for example, in the last um, 15, 20 years, th there's been absolutely huge migration uh, out of the city of London, out of the, uh, the greater London uh, council area, the greater London authority area, into the excerpts. It's happening all over. So uh, to get back to, uh, again, terms, when you say people are leaving the urban areas, they're they're staying within the metropolitan area, right? So they're staying within the Generally MSA. Generally speaking, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, the, the migration in metropolitan areas tends to be from the core cities um, to the suburban areas. Now, by the way, in the United States, our only good migration data is at the county level. So it's a, it's a little uh, tough, but the data is very clear there. Same thing is happening in Europe. Um, at, but, at, but, but the reason I say exurban area in, in London is they have a green belt that makes it impossible to grow beyond the city, um, which is a big city. It's 10 million people. And so of 10 or 15 miles further out is where the growth has occurred over the last 50 years. Outside that, that green belt? Outside the green belt. So, so that, in fact, uh, in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, in England, where they were attempting to stop sprawl, they have actually exploded sprawl. Uh, so, I, so I imagine what happens is, and I'm aware of this in the United States and some places that have, uh, that have used um, uh, uh, land use policies to restrict uh, sprawl, that what's happened is uh, the downtown property, because there's uh, uh, so little of it and, and demand goes up, becomes very, very expensive. Uh, only the wealthy live in the downtown core. And so then you have these poorer suburbs, uh, which is uh, uh, almost contrary to the Kansas City model. Well, yeah. In fact, you take a look at California, which was by far the fastest growing state in, from 1850 until about three years ago. Well, not three years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, the latest the latest estimates from the Census Bureau are that ca that California lost 70,000 people last year. Um, and by the way, in the last 20 years, more than two and a half million people net have moved out of California to the rest of the country. There have been years when Kansas City has had net migration from San Francisco. And that's what has happened because the cost of living has been driven so high by the distortive uh, land use policies of California, uh, that people are basically saying, hey, you know, I like the beach, but I am not willing to live in, in, in the conditions I have to live in to enjoy this beach. And so that's why Texas is growing really fast. Oklahoma is gaining uh, migrants from California. Uh, the world is changing. So I've heard a lot about migration out of California. Of course, the news has talked about migration of the wealthy out of New York and out of Connecticut. Uh, is there data, uh, maybe in the past ten years, about um, is that actually uh, is that actually the case? You talked about California. I'm always wary of the the news report that focuses on an anecdote um, and then doesn't talk about uh, the bigger picture. I'm aware, for example, that you will say that California has lost a uh, population, but it's getting it's getting population from overseas, right? So. No. The, the the net the, the net the, population of California, as I understand it, hasn't been as as hurt. But but go ahead, disagree. No, I mean there's been almost no growth in California in the last five years. We've seen an interesting phenomenon occur around the country where a, a number of formerly fast growing places have virtually died in terms of their growth. But California actually lost seventy thousand people net uh, from all sources um, in in the last year. Um, and in the last year, uh, California, in the last 10 years, that is from 2010 to 2019, my recollection is that California lost about 800,000 people. That is lost uh, that many migrants. That's not population. That's people moving out over people moving in. State of New York has lost even more. And, uh, and you see the huge migration gains in Texas, in um, Florida, in Oregon and Washington and Colorado, where the house prices are very high, but you're beginning to see migration slow to those places because the great advantage that those places have is that they're not California. Tennessee is now emerging as a major migration hub as well. I was in Nashville last summer, and even before they saw a lot of uh, you know Amazon come in, they they are clearly struggling with the population growth they have right now. You can kind of see that if they don't start focusing on their infrastructure, they're going to be overwhelmed. Yep. 
That's always uh, a problem. So I guess I want to ask you, you don't necessarily, or maybe you do, you're not betting against the city. Population may shift out of California cities, may shift out of New York cities, but they're moving to other cities. They're just um, moving maybe to cheaper, more manageable cities, or is there in fact a migration away from built up urban areas into rural and suburban areas around the country? Well, that that is going to be a very interesting thing because my sense is with what's gone on during the COVID uh, uh, situation, we're actually now beginning to see people move or we may be beginning to see people moving into rural areas uh, because of the ability to do remote work. But yes, for the most part, certainly up to 2019, which is our latest migration data, when someone moves from uh, Fresno or from San Francisco, uh, they tend to move to Austin or Houston or Oklahoma City or Miami or someplace like that or Atlanta. Uh, yes, we are a metropolitan uh, nation. If, if you take the population of the 53 metropolitan areas with more than a million people, it's about 180 million of 320 million people. So that the, the, the metropolitan areas really are dominant, and that's only the metropolitan areas of over a million. I, I can't remember what the number is. It's 20 or 30 million are, are over um, 500,000 as well. So we're becoming really a metropolitan nation. So let me talk or, or ask about the, the impact on those built up municipalities that are losing population to even within the MSA, uh, losing population to smaller municipalities or rural suburban areas. Uh, what is the impact to them, uh, not just in population loss, but you know revenue? And, and generally, what are these cities trying to do to combat it? Well, that's a good question. And, and the, 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 the thing about it is that um, one of the one of the things we've seen happen in the last 10 or 20 years is uh, gains of, of young people into some core or urban cores, uh, CBD cores, downtown cores. Uh, this has happened particularly with respect to Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and even Boston. Uh, but what happens after they, they have the first kid is they move to the suburbs. Um, and so, you know, cities are going to have to do a lot better. The, the, the core cities um, that we're talking largely about, the 100 largest, uh, are going to have to do a lot better job to compete in the future. They haven't been competing well for the most part up to this point, except for cities like Austin, uh, which are really half suburban or more suburban. So it's pretty difficult, and they've got to maintain. They've got to keep their taxes down, um, and and it's not easy with the political um, uh, 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 influences that exist in those cities. Do you think? I wonder if cities in Texas and Tennessee and Florida are benefiting because they have something to offer, or is it just because they aren't the places that people are leaving? Right, the California, the New York. Uh, it may be that. The Austins and the Nashvilles uh, don't yet have the problems, but they will in five or 10 years. And, and the people who move there may move on or move back. Well, it's hard to say. Uh, the, the, the fact is that the Texas cities and Florida cities do have some advantages, uh, but they have also, uh, they also are in a competitive situation. Uh, and and there's one of the things that's really gone wrong in California and Oregon and Washington and Colorado, for that matter, is is a lot of the policies that have forced people to begin to move away um, have been initiated at the state level. And so it's not just, you know, cities and municipality, I should say cities and metropolitan areas are very important, but state policy is very important as well. And in, I should say Oregon, Washington, California the counterproductive land use policies, which have made the cost of living so high that people are moving, especially out of California, um, those have really been state level uh, initiatives. So give me two or three examples of, of land use policies that uh, people might be more familiar with. Well, the, the, big, the big problem in land use policy is um, urban containment policy, policy that basically draws a line around a city, around an urban area and says, development shall not go any further than this. M most of our audience is probably not old enough to remember the 1970s when uh, the Arabs did that with respect to oil in the United States and the price of gasoline tripled almost all overnight. 
When you do that kind of thing, you raise the price of housing. And in fact, the price of housing represents 85% of the difference in the cost of living between California and the rest of the country and, and other places. Housing affordability drives um, the standard of living. And people are looking for a good standard of living. And, and if you look at the data on housing affordability and the standard of living, you find that it really is driving um, migration. So uh, the, the key in, in places like Texas is that they have kept housing under control. And that's a real big thing because it is the largest element of the family budget. But we'll be talking about housing uh, in the series in the next few weeks uh, because I think you're exactly right. It affects so much of our experience within cities. Let me talk a little bit about uh, sprawl, which is the movement uh, or perhaps the encouragement of people to move out of cities into the suburbs. Um, certainly in the 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, small uh, uh, communities outside of the urban core used all sorts of uh, tax uh, incentives to lure businesses, employers, and homeowners uh, out into the suburbs. But we find now that the cost of maintaining all that infrastructure is so high that uh, if people who lived out in the suburbs paid the true cost of their ranch house and the roads and the electricity, um, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to uh, to afford it. To what degree? I'm sorry. What's that? I'm sorry, I disagree with that. I've I've seen you know I, I I don't I don't buy that at all. Why they they would be moving back if they could then? They're not. People are still moving to the suburbs at very high rates. In the last ten years, the movement to the suburbs has been more than ninety percent of the population growth in the fifty largest metropolitan areas. So that's that. I mean, I know the planners like to talk about that, but let's look at what really is happening. And people are not moving back. And it is less expensive for the most part. And uh, and oh, well, let's put it this way: people generally, you you can you can sort of divine the preferences of people by what they do. Now, granted, all of us would like to live in Beverly Hills, but not all of us can afford to. So we're going to go and live where we are the most comfortable and where we can have the best lifestyle. And frankly, for the most part, you can see from the movement of people that it is in the suburbs, and there's no move back to the city at all. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. From a city's point of view, it is uh, cheaper to maintain a dense population because you've got more taxpayers per acre per square mile. So you can provide uh, more services or at least provide the same services cheaper per capita, right? You'll agree with that? No, not at all. Uh, the fact is that costs are not the same. There is, yes, the cost of building infrastructure. It is not the same. It is not always the same in the suburban jurisdictions. You have to renew that infrastructure. And now with the great interest in the big cities in densification, you're going to find an awful lot of the time that the sewers aren't large enough to handle the new volume of the higher, uh, of the higher population densities that are sought. More importantly, however, are issues like labor costs, pension costs, et cetera. And I've, I've done studies on this in five states at this point, and, and we have been successful in largely um, uh, uh, slowing down or stopping attempts to merge cities together because we've been able to show that the smaller jurisdictions have lower unit costs. And one of the main reasons they have lower unit costs is the labor costs are lower and the pension costs are lower. You cannot assume that, that, that costs are lower just because you have a lot more people living in a, a smaller area. The unit costs in the states that I've, that, that I've studied are higher in the big cities than they are in the small cities. So that's, I'm, I'm great to have you say that. That's really uh, news to me and, and almost counterintuitive. And it's, it is, so, so what's driving that? Why? Why would a city be more expensive? Is it just the cost of labor and, and, and things like that? A lot of it has to do with legacy costs. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the central, I mean, the, a, a lot of the central cities had high costs in the beginning. It's one of the reasons why people moved out. Taxes were higher. You had uh, all sorts of things done to keep taxes lower in the suburbs. And uh, the differential rate of taxation, 
was one of the major factors in movements. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not indicting all central cities, but the fact is, generally speaking, if you want to talk to suburbanites about why they moved, they moved because taxes were smaller or lower. They moved because they had local democracy as opposed to, you know, a city council uh, made up of 15 people with with 200,000 or 100,000 uh, residents in their district. And of course, education. And by the way, of course, we all recognize that education, while it may be uh, the responsibility of, of some municipalities, for the most part, education is not at all under the control of, of cities, yet they have to uh, face the music with respect to the reputations that they receive with respect to having education uh, outcomes that are not as good as people might want to have in uh, that, that move to the suburbs. So uh, I, I want to stay on this. What are some examples of uh, cities uh, spread out, uh, smaller population, less density that are better able to provide services than a built up urban environment? Well, they're all built up. We're talking. We're t we're talking here. Um, uh, 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 you, you know, we're we're talking about cities in metropolitan areas. I'm telling you, within a metropolitan area, the smaller cities overall <clears throat> are going to have better, substantially lower costs, uh, unit costs of of operation. And I mean, the the reports that we have done have have uh, have dealt with thousands of cities in individual states. So, I mean, you, you know, you name it. I mean, it would be rare to find uh, a city in Ohio, for example, that um, is, is going to, a small city in Ohio that's going to have unit costs that are as, as, as high as the larger cities in Ohio. Just the case. Regrettably, uh, there, there has been a, the, the academic um, uh, literature has largely suggested all of these things that you're talking about with respect to economies of scale and so on, but they have never checked. And uh, um, there have been economic, what was her name? Um, the economist um, at University of Indiana that won the Nobel Prize before she passed away a few years ago. One of her big points was that smaller units of government tend to perform better than larger. And the problem is that the Th those who have made the point about uh, about um, unit costs being lower in larger urban areas uh, in larger in larger jurisdictions haven't checked the data. We just assume that by the enunciation of a theory that the theory has been achieved. Well, it hasn't been. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the impact in the last year of, of COVID and and what you anticipate might. Um what the next few years might bring. But I, I want you to talk about, the because uh, I, I know you've spent a lot of your career talking about transportation. In Kansas City, we are uh, launching, uh, you know, streetcars, uh, but the same people who are fans of that type of transit bemoan uh, the use of uh, funds for highways and cars. Uh, what are the trends in, in transportation leading up to, say, the beginning of 2020? Are more people riding? Uh, uh, public transit? Are more people relying on cars? Do the costs tell us anything? Well, yeah. The uh, First of all, public, public transit continues to wallow down around 5% of the market. 60% uh, uh, of the transit work trip destinations in the United States are in six municipalities, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, San Francisco, and Washington. Those six municipalities have 8% of the jobs and 60% of the transit commuting, okay? That tells you something. Now, beyond that, if you go to COVID, and so we, we got some great transit systems in this country, but, but they really largely serve only downtown. If you want to go to work, uh, people with cars and people who have houses generally ride transit to work only to downtown because they can't get to anywhere else in the metropolitan area very quickly on transit. The, I'm very concerned in the longer run of what's, about what's going to happen to transit because for example, you take uh, the, the areas that are likely to be most uh, threatened by telework, which is increasing incredibly. Um, Stanford is, is uh, estimating that 40 per, 42% of the workers in the United States, including those that are unemployed due to COVID, 42% are now remote working. That is eight times 
what the rate was last year in, in 2019. Now let's go to New York, which has by far the best mass transit system in North America. Um, the Long Island and Metro North railways, which are commuter railways that go out to the end of Long Island and up into Connecticut to New Haven and to Bridgeport and so on, they are now operating at 75 to 80 percent below last year. The, uh, the same thing with New Jersey Transit, the same thing with commuter rail all over the country. The inner city transit systems are, work, are doing much better, uh, but one of the reasons that that's true is that the inner city transit systems uh, have a lot more customers that don't have access to automobiles. So there are some real problems. And my own view is that, uh, say, New York, where you have about 2 million people used to work south of 59th Street, uh, you can't, if you have 2 million people in 10 square miles working, you can't socially distance. And we hear from Dr. Fauci that there are going to be more um, uh, pandemics and so on. I think we're going to see a much different time, and it's going to take some good, hard thinking on figuring out how to make this work for cities, uh, for, 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 you know, central cities, the ones with the downtown areas. Uh, I talked a little bit about the, uh, in the introduction about my conjecture that uh, COVID, ha in, in as much as it turned density from an, uh, a benefit to an albatross, uh, may keep people off the transit systems you just described. Uh, may in fact continue people moving out of uh, of the urban core. I know we're still in the midst of it. Uh, we may not know for years, but are there any bits of data that we're aware of that that tell us what's happening, or uh, what should we look for in the next few months or years as a signpost of what's going on? It's going to be di very difficult, and the data, you know, well, the, the data is getting a lot better because of people like Google, organizations like Google, and so on. But first of all, we've got to reopen. I mean, New York hasn't even reopened at this point, seriously. Uh, and now, granted, New York can't reopen because we can't give up on social social distancing. I mean, you think about uh, what we've done is basically interrupt the careers of people at this point for a year. It's probably going to be maybe as much as another year before we, we're back to normal. So I think it's reasonable to assume that any recovery in the um, in the transit systems is going to be uh, slow and it may never recover. I, I, I think it is is foolhardy for our metropolitan planning organizations to to go forward and plan for transit improvements as if it were 2018. It is 2020. And uh, we could very well see um, very serious uh, ridership losses. We've already seen it. I mean, think about BART, which was the largest uh, new rail transit system built in the United States since World War II uh, before Metro in Washington. BART continues to wallow at 89% below its last year volumes. So uh, I think it's going to be very tough. What do you imagine the other impacts of the pandemic will be on metropolitan areas, on built up urban areas, or, or maybe even, uh, you know, those smaller cities that that might benefit? Well, I think one of the things that's going to happen, we're already seeing it happen, is the huge increase in telework. It's very popular, not only with people, with workers, but also with companies. So we're going to see a lot more of that. And that means, for example, that, that some people in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, are going to decide, you know what, I could live in Tahoe and I can work from there. And some of the companies are going to permit that to happen. So I think we're going to see in the more vibrant metropolitan areas, the, the, the Nashvilles of the world, the Atlantas, the Houstons, the Dallas-Fort Worth, we're going to see people move even further out than they bid before because they want more space, they want a yard, all that kind of thing. We're also going to see a move to some extent of people to very nice places. I mean, there probably are people who are going to be working from Vail in the Colorado Rockies, um, and, and telecommuting to uh, to New York. Uh, we see much of Wall Street. It was reported yesterday, I think, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, a, a good portion of Wall Street seems to be inclined to move to Florida. So we're liable to see some major changes. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that the New York metropolitan area is going to go from 20 million to 10 million. It probably isn't going to fall much at all, but we're going to see probably less core density. And by the way, with respect to, de to densification, you know, that's the policy of everybody.
but it's not being achieved anywhere. So what would be the first signs of that? I would imagine uh, commercial real estate rates would be maybe an early sign that uh, uh, more people are telecommuting. I think it was uh, sometime early last year, Twitter said that they were fine if their employees all worked from home. That's going to impact uh, a San Francisco. I, I imagine. Uh, uh, so so real estate, what are the other early signs of, of change? Well, First, first of all, the telecommuting thing is the telecommuting or the remote working is the big deal. I mean, the Irish government has now basically uh, adopted a policy that is encouraging telework. They're saying one of the reasons that and, and I and, and I suggest that this needs to happen in the States. One of the reasons that telework makes sense is because a lot of people that are affluent, fairly affluent, will move out of the core cities farther out, reducing demand in these 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 cities that, where the markets have been distorted by by um, by bad land use policies, and we might begin to see the affordability crisis to some degree uh, dealt with. But that the telecommute, the re, the remote working thing, is something you're not going to get away with. I, I mean, the fact is that the 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 new um, what do they call it? The new Hudson Yards uh, uh, project on West 34th Street in in Manhattan over the over the train stations. Uh, the shopping centers are empty. There's great concern about it. The world is going to change an awful lot. But I think the, the people are going to decide. No, no planner is going to tell people they can't telecommute. They may tell them that they can't build a house somewhere, but they're not going to tell them that they can't move to North Dakota or South Dakota. And a lot of people may be doing that. What are your, uh, first of all, again, let me encourage people that are watching, if you have a question, email it to dolequestions at ku.edu, and we'll get to those shortly. Wendell, what recommendations would you make to uh, city policymakers, elected or career? Uh, how can they um, improve their cities? How can they take advantage of changes um, that, uh, uh, that, that will help them survive into the next uh, century? Well, it's, it's tough. Um, what I think cities have got to do is recognize that if they want to grow, they've got to attract people and they've got to attract businesses. They're not going to do it unless they are um, uh, less expensive, unless they're competitive is, is the real key. Um, oh, my goodness. Hold on. I, I'm sorry. I, it, Windows has just told me he's going to re, re the, um, so So you've got to uh, be looking at keeping your taxes down, reducing your taxes, improving your education, and so on. And, you know, uh, subsidizing a sports stadium is not going to do it. Um, it's a new paradigm, um, and it's not easy. You consult with uh, public policy leaders around the world. I know you've you've traveled to China quite a bit and 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 elsewhere. Are there three things that you consistently tell them to watch out for or look out for? Are there are there pieces of advice that you give around the world that that people in the United States should hear? Well, yeah, it's this, it's, it's the same thing as I've been saying all along. One. Housing affordability is absolutely crucial, and virtually all of the housing affordability problem in this country at this point has been created by land use policy that has changed since there wasn't a problem in the late 60s and early 70s. So that's that's one thing that's, that's very important. Um, also a recognition of the limitations of transit. Um, you know, regrettably, transit Keep, compete, it cannot compete with the car anywhere except to downtown. And it does a better job of getting you downtown than the car does. But in terms of getting you to uh, the, a, a large number of jobs, I mean, only 3% of the jobs in New York, in the New York metropolitan area, can be reached in 30 minutes by transit. Something like 15%, five or six times as many jobs can be reached by car. So again, you have to realize that it is people who make these decisions and cities have got to get ahead of these people and try to, to anticipate what they will do and what businesses will do. Uh, we have a question from one of our viewers. Uh, I think you've already addressed it, but maybe there's an opportunity to be more specific. David asks, uh, COVID has caused uh, more and more people to work from home. What impact do you think this will have on movement in and out of cities? And again, they may stay within the metropolitan area, but just move out of the, the urban core. 
Yeah, my yeah, I think we're already seeing it happen. And, and you know, somebody that you think about, for example, I talk, I mentioned the Metro North Railway that goes up to um, to to New Haven. Um, ridership is down eighty to eighty five percent at this point. There are all sorts of executives who live up there in Connecticut that used to go into Grand Central Station on the railroad every day. Now they may only go in once or twice a week or once or twice a month, and they're not going to change. Um, so, so already, I think we're some of what has happened will continue. That doesn't mean it's all going to continue, but yes, it's going to happen. But uh, my sense is that a lot of people are are going to be more inclined to move out to where they can have more space. They're going to be wanting to be maybe within an hour to an hour and a half of, of an airport. Uh, that way they can get anywhere they need to if they're executives and that kind of thing. But this is going to have a huge impact, and, and there is not a plan that will be capable of controlling the behavior of people who decide that for the sake of the safety of their families, they're moving. You can't do that. Uh, along those lines, um, Zach asks, how might self-driving cars impact cities in the U.S.? I've wondered this myself. You talk oh, about boy. people who are willing to uh, commute an hour uh, right now, but if you don't have to pay attention while you're driving, your commute time uh, can be much, much longer. Well, yeah, that combined with, you know, there's all sorts of really bad research out there that talks about how we could do the same amount of movement with um, one seventh the number of cars and have all sorts of car sharing and so on. It's not going to happen. I, what woman is going to get into a car uh, that's going to be uh, picking up other people along the way that she doesn't know um, to get across town. I won't even do that. The assumption of planners that the self-driving car is going to create all sorts of ride sharing, it's just simply not going to happen. Anybody that thinks our cities are safe enough, that we're going to be confident enough to get into shared rides with people we don't, we don't know, they don't understand how human nature works. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be much of a problem in terms of increasing commute times. Um, I am very suspicious, however, I mean, commute distances. I am very con suspicious, however, of the claims that it's going to be less costly. Uh, I don't believe that for a moment. It may be in the beginning, but I don't expect it to be in the long run. So while self-driving self cars have some advantages, um, I'm not terribly convinced by a lot of the projections about what the, those impacts will be. Uh, I just don't think it's going to happen. It, it seems to me, and again, uh, I've done zero research on this, but it seems to me that self-driving cars could have a tremendous impact on uh, public transit. We already know some cities have partnered uh, with Uber and Lyft at providing paratransit. If a city uh, potentially could save a lot of money by scrapping their, their bus system and maybe issuing vouchers for, again, ride sharing or self-driving cars, but but I can't say that I'm aware of any research on that because we haven't seen the market open up. Well, I'll go you one better. Think, of, think about, you know, we have in this country low-income areas. Sometimes they're called ghettos. And they have good transit service oftentimes because they're near the central business district. And people can get to work downtown. But what if the job's out toward the suburbs? There, there was a report done by the Federal Transit Administration in the 90s that basically said there, were, there was no one in the city of Boston that could get to the new developing jobs in the, in the suburbs of Boston. Now, what if instead of subsidizing public transit, we subsidized rides for people on automated cars based upon income? Now, all of a sudden, they've probably got five, 10, or 15 times as many jobs that they can, that they can choose from. I mean, you know, living in a low-income area without a car is a real problem. So I, I see that as one of the great advantages about the self-driving car in the long run. Uh, and, and indeed, that's what needs to be subsidized because um, transit does, again, a good job of getting you downtown, but downtown represents 6% of the jobs in our metropolitan areas, at most 20%. And a lot of people seem to think that everybody works downtown. Well, not even in New York is that the case. Uh, you remind me of the observation I made uh, that uh, streetcars don't take you where you wanna go. Streetcars take you where developers want you to go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Wendell, I know you're familiar with the border war in Kansas City, where the municipalities on either side of state line in Kansas and in Missouri 
have spent millions of dollars to lure employers across state line to claim a, a kind of a micro benefit within their municipality. Um, the, the recent border war truce that we've heard a lot of uh, uh, talk about in Kansas um, has been heralded as an opportunity for cities around the country. Have you seen other cities that have kind of a border war where they're fighting with each other with the incentives? And uh, is that, uh, is that going to get worse in the future, do you think, or, or will it get better? Or do you have an opinion? Uh, well, it's hard to say. And I, I've got to admit that I don't have a good sense of, of what the border wars have been like in, in Kansas City. Um, I suppose it, it sounds like they may have been worse where you are. I mean, you think about Cincinnati. Cincinnati is not only in Ohio, but it's also in Indiana and Kentucky. Portland's in Oregon and Washington. Uh, we have all sorts of sort of by and uh, where, where I live in the St. Louis area is in Illinois and Missouri. Uh, there have been all sorts of um, uh, there are all sorts of metropolitan areas that stretch into more than one state. Um, and and uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, just moving uh, across the border doesn't gain much of anything. Um, but I, I wonder if maybe you might be facing, for whatever reasons, more uh, more of a problem than than uh, than elsewhere. Do you see any impact of uh, climate change on uh, the development of cities, the move to the suburbs, or or uh, or demographics in general? Well, I, I know that there's a great th th that's been one of the great interests of uh, of uh, the planning community, you know, to force people to move back to the city and that not move back to forgive me for calling it that because most of them never lived in the city. Um, but the fact is, we don't see that happening anywhere. Um, and uh, so, you know, that really, I don't think is going to play uh, much. And, you know, you look at the efforts that are being made right now, for example, in California, and, and it's hard to find a state that's had more distortive policies than California, where, by the way, I was born. Um, but, you know, the state is going out of its way to create an environment in which cars uh, can be used just like they're used today and used without the same environmental impacts as the gasoline and fossil fuel built cars. So, so my sense is that... Um, uh, cities are going to continue to look a, a lot like they do now, and they're already, um, you know, largely uh, dependent on cars. A transit doesn't, tra transit simply can't get you from A to B unless B happens to be downtown. Uh, another question, Kate asks, many hospitals are located in urban areas. Uh, are you aware of any trend where hospitals are moving out to the suburbs? Well, I, I think, yeah, I've got to admit not to have done a, a survey of uh, locations of hospitals, but my sense is around the, uh, around the country, there are plenty of hospitals in suburban areas. However, you know, some of the best hospitals, you think about Barnes Jewish in St. Louis, the Cleveland Clinic in, say, in Cleveland, and that's real important in a city that's had a terrible time. The medical, um, the Houston Medical Center, uh, et cetera. It may be that that's a natural for uh, for core cities. I've not studied that, but I think that's a good point. Uh, well, Wendell, we're at the end of our time today. I want to thank you for your time, for your expertise, for uh, uh, great answers to questions. I learned an awful lot. I want to follow up about the uh, cost per unit uh, for, for serving populations in urban areas and in the suburbs. Uh, I want to thank uh, the people who asked questions and all of you for watching. Next week, March 3, we will talk even more about municipal finance. And my panelists will be Professor Whitney Afonso, a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Government, and Dennis Strait, an architect and landscape architect with 38 years of experience, currently serving as principal in Kansas City of Gould Evans. Uh, thank Again, thank all of you. Wendell, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you.